Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on the links under my Instagram accounts, either at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for Life. I'd like to start with some words from a book called Playing Big by Tara Moore. I feel as if I'm about to let you in on a priceless secret. Again and again, the women I work with tell me that this is the practice that has made the most dramatic difference in their lives and work. I first encountered it when I was studying at the Coaches Training Institute. In one of my initial workshops there, the teachers led us through a visualization exercise they called Future Self. They dimmed the lights, asked us to close our eyes, get comfortable, take some deep breaths, and relax. Then for about 20 minutes, they narrated as each of us visualized traveling to Earth 20 years in the future. We met our future selves, the woman or man we'd become 20 years from now. The teachers led us step by step by arriving, step by step to arriving at his or her home, asked us to notice what kind of place did she live in, what was her presence like, who was the woman who greeted us at the door. They told us to have a, a chat with this older self, to ask him or her questions like, what do I need to know to get from where I am at to where you are, and what has been most important about the last 20 years. We could ask this future self about any dilemma in our lives and see what he or she had to say about it. Then they guided us to bring the conversation to an end and to imagine ourselves traveling back to earth in the present day. We opened our eyes and in the silence wrote down what we each seen in the visualization. Then several of the students shared about their experiences. Most had been extremely moved by the future self they'd met. A business executive in his 60s who had seemed emotionally numb through the course cried profusely when he talked about his older self. A mom of four who was usually exhausted and stressed seemed rejuvenated and calm. As people spoke about their experiences, it became clear The future selves they encountered were not really just older versions of themselves. They were more like guides, mentors with incredible wisdom, figures who imparted a sense of peace and integrity so profound it could hardly be put into words. They'd met individuals who weren't merely older selves, but more authentic, fully expressed versions of themselves. And in these future selves, all their best qualities and gifts shone brightly. The teachers explained that this was an exercise we could do with our coaching clients to help them uncover visions for their future and a sense of their more fulfilled, authentic selves. That day when I did the future self visualization, things didn't go so well for me. My classmates were having poignant, joyful experiences, but I was not. When the teachers asked us to see the home of our future self, I saw a small, ramshacked, decaying house. A haggard, depleted woman came to the door. She wore a tattered apron over a faded house dress, no makeup, no jewelry, and her uncared-for hair fell around her face. She looked so tired, so beaten down, so sad. I immediately had the sense that the reason for all this was because she had put everyone else's needs before her own for the 20 years that stood between me and her. There was simply nothing left of her. When I asked her the questions the teachers told us to ask our future selves rather than providing me with wisdom, she tearfully asked me for help, for rescue. I was disappointed. Everyone else in the room, all my fellow coaches in training, were sharing epiphanies and accounts of the inspiring visions they'd encountered. What did this mean for me and my future? I tentatively raised my hand. What if you have a negative experience? And I described what I had seen. 
Well, that won't do, my teacher Carla immediately said. She guided me through a shortened form of the exercise again, this time in front of the whole class. The second time I saw a very different picture. The woman I saw lived in a house by the sea, next to roaring waves. She was a writer. That came as a total surprise at the time because I wasn't doing any writing then and hadn't written for years. But this woman, writing was the center of her life and her work. Her home and personal style had a zen-like simplicity mine didn't. I noticed a short, very neat to-do list on a small pad on her empty kitchen counter with a great black ink pen. I was always losing pens, writing with crappy ones, and being annoyed by it, and keeping way too many piles of paper around. I had the sense that she'd simplified her life and her daily routine dramatically. Her appearance exuded a kind of earthly femininity, long flowing hair, soft colors, nothing like the trousers and blazers I wore to work every day. I could tell that her spirituality was at the center of her life. I was in a kind of spiritual dry spell. She was clearly also an artist, and her legs showed me a dancer. My passions for art and dance had been neglected for many years, and she lived in a house by the sea. She could see and hear ocean waves from her windows. I lived in a house by the freeway. I recognized her. She was a composite of all the most important parts of me that I had left behind. I got the message. The first depressing picture showed me the waste of a life I'd end up having if I continued my worst people-pleasing behaviors and kept doing only the things that were in my small comfort zone or that were acceptable to others. The woman in my second visualization felt both unfamiliar and familiar. Some parts of her I immediately knew were buried parts of myself. Other aspects of her life and home felt more surprising and mysterious. The minimalism, the simplicity, a kind of feeling of solitude. I had the census woman represented in a not quite literal form, the woman I was at my core and the woman that I was meant to be. Stephen Pressfield says in his book, The War of Art. Have you heard this story? Woman learns she has cancer, six months to live. Within days, she quits her job, resumes the dream of writing Tex-Mex songs. She gave up to raise a family or starts studying classical Greek or moves to the inner city and devotes herself to tending babies with AIDS. Women's friends think she is crazy. She herself has never been happier. There's a postscript. Women's can- woman's cancer goes into remission. Is that what it takes? Do we have to stare death in the face to make us stand up and confront resistance? Does resistance have to cripple and disfigure our lives before we wake up to its existence? How many of us have become drunks and drug addicts, developed tumors and neuroses, succumb to painkillers, gossip, and compulsive cell phone use simply because we don't do that thing that our hearts, our inner genius, is calling us to do. Resistance defeats us. If tomorrow morning, by some stroke of magic, every dazed and benighted soul woke up with the power to take the first step toward pursuing his or her dreams, every shrink in the directory would be out of business. Prisons would stand empty. The alcohol and tobacco industries would collapse along with the junk food, cosmetic surgery, and infotainment businesses. Not to mention pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, and the medical profession from top to bottom. Domestic abuse would become extinct, as would addiction, obesity, migraine headaches, road rage. Look in your heart. Unless I'm crazy, right now, a still small voice is piping up, telling you, as it has 10,000 times, the calling that is yours and yours alone. You know it. No one has to tell you. 
and unless I'm crazy, you're no closer to that act, taking that action on it than you were yesterday, or will be tomorrow. You think resistance isn't real. Resistance will bury you. You know, Hitler wanted to be an artist. At 18, he took his inheritance, 700 Kronen, moved to Vienna to live and study. He applied to the Academy of Fine Arts and later to the School of Architecture. Ever seen one of his paintings? Neither have I. Resistance beat him. Call it overstatement, but I'll say it anyway. It was easier for Hitler to start World War II than it was for him to see a blank square of canvas. Judges 6.12 The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. In Priscilla Shearer's book, Awaken, she says, For several evenings while getting ready for bed, I noticed in the mirror an angry, dark bruise on the, my lower back. Where had it come from? Should I be worried? Why wasn't it getting any better? And why, when I finally asked my husband to look at it, did he dismissively say he didn't see anything? What? It's right there, I said, pointing to the ugly splotch I could see clearly reflected in my closet mirror. Coming closer, he scanned my back for the same blemish I was seeing. Nope, nothing. Until, oh, he finally said, apparently locating it but without the same sense of concern in his voice I was expecting to hear. Instead, he sort of laughed while taking both of my arms in his two brawny hands, scooting me about six inches to the right. Gone now? I looked back in the mirror, astonished that my husband had performed a modern-day miracle. He was right. It was gone. The dark patch I'd mistaken as a problem area on my body had been nothing more than a shadow in the room. A simple shift, a mere change in perspective, changed everything. The Old Testament shadow that had long been cast across Gideon's life had caused him to see himself as a timid, fearful, doubtful, incapable person. Like others of his countrymen, his entire existence had been discolored by the silhouette of that dreaded enemy, the Midianites leaving him a defeated shell of a man, intimidated into hiding, not wanting to attract noise or draw attention to himself. But when the angel of the Lord appeared one day, while Gideon was threshing wheat in a shaded wine press to keep from being seen, the surprising words of an angel tugged him out of the shadows and into the clarifying light of Yahweh's perspective. The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. He was valiant, and he was a warrior. Despite the shadows, God considered him capable of brave exploits and sent the pre-incarnate Christ to tell him so. Thus began a series of changes that transform, transformed Gideon from an insecure coward into a gal, gal, gallant, gallant captain of Israel's fighting men. By revealing an inner potential that no one, neither Gideon or anybody else had ever noticed, the angel moved him into a position for God to bring out a courage he could use to inspire a nation to victory. Take a good look at yourself and the reality of your current circumstances. Has the shadow of your situation cast a gloomy haze on how you see yourself? Do you doubt what God's word says about you based on what you see when you look in the mirror? That you are loved, forgiven, known, and thoroughly provided for? God's spirit is tugging you out of those shadows today, clearing away the stains you've misread as permanent fixtures on your soul. May the one who redeemed you by his own blood redefine your identity in the light of his mercy, promise, and power.